appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, oh, night, when Christ was born. It's so great to see all friends and visitors and brave souls who have come out today. Welcome, welcome to Elkport Community Church. Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, in verse 21. The Gospel according to Luke, the doctor, chapter 2, verse 21. I'd like to uh, talk about today, if I may, by the grace of God, what happened after the manger? After the manger is the title of this, if you're the camera person doing the editing. What happened after the manger? Everybody knows that story, right? Shepherds, wise men, maybe the wise men weren't there that night, maybe they're still out and shooting by the time you know, they got there, but who knows? Luke chapter 2. Uh, it's well known and well widely spoken and believed that Luke went back to the promised land many years after, and he interviewed some people. He sat down with Mary, and he uh, sat down with some of the people of that time, and he personally interviewed them and prayed about it before he wrote it down for us. So he did his homework. He did his research. So uh, this is a pretty good account of what happened after the manger. Now, as you well know, Israel has been waiting, expecting a Messiah. And they are expecting one that was going to come like King David and do this, that, and the other. You're, we're well familiar with that. But instead, they got a baby in a feeding trough, and only shepherds and people from very far away were privy to it. Everybody else was like, not really sure what was going on. So he's here, there's a baby. Right? And uh, not too many of the Jewish population were in tune with that and on board with that. But God still was at work, and he was still using people, and, and God's about to bring the greatest life ever lived into our presence, into our beautiful world, for the purpose of showing us who God is, and for the purpose of bringing us back to himself. Jesus. And now, he's a little baby. Okay, he's born. Now what? Now what do we do? Well, of course you know, every Jew had this thing called the Old Testament. Right? That's all they had because they hadn't written the New Testament yet. Uh, Jesus never spoke, as far as I know, from the New Testament. He quoted the Old Testament all the time. So they knew somebody was coming, but in those laws, in those rule books, in those stories, in the book of Leviticus, 
when a firstborn male comes along, uh, he's to be dedicated to the Lord and circumcised on the eighth day. Let's read about that a little bit. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Luke chapter 2, verse 21. It says, Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel, even before he was conceived. All right, now, uh, there's, there's something very significant about why eight days later do you do this thing to the male child? You know, I don't want to linger on this subject, but it was a thing. It was an Old Testament covenant since Abraham that the males were to be circumcised. Why in the law was it the eighth day? And now, have you ever asked that question? Sure you have. Everybody asked that question. You don't have to admit it. Old question. Why eight days? Why not seven days? Why not six days? Well, they didn't know this back then, but God knew this. On the eighth day, an infant in, in this world, breathing air like the rest of us for the first time, on the eighth day, their blood was finally able to coagulate. So if there was a minor surgery of any sort, the blood was, and on the eighth day, it had the ability to coagulate. Am I right? All right. Well, now with modern medicine, we don't need to wait till the eighth day. We've got all this technology. But back then, they did it on the eighth day because they were told to. But they didn't have doctors. Well, we had Luke, but not, they didn't really know a lot about this stuff. But you know what? The Creator, God Himself, knew this. And that's why He said the eighth day and not the seventh day or the third day. Interesting stuff, huh? They say there's no God. You know, I once saw an x-ray of a spine. Did you know they're all numbered? Every time you see an x-ray of a spine, they're all numbered, and they say there's no God. Anyway, that's pretty deep. I'm sorry. It's a joke, actually. I'll try harder on my next one. You never saw an x-ray of a spine? You don't know what I'm talking about. Never mind. <laughs> You go and uh, don't work Google anymore, but find something else and do your research on the spine <clears throat> and x-rays. And then you come back and you laugh at my joke. And they say there's no God. So, verse 22. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses. After the birth of a child, so his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, now again, this is in Leviticus chapter 12. If a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. A, a, an ox was not required, nor a lamb. It was something that a moderately employed or a poorer family could afford. So we know Joseph wasn't rolling in, in cash and Mary. They were a young couple just getting started in their new life. But Jesus, according to the law, on the eighth day, fulfilling the law, and he continued to fulfill the law his entire life. And as you read in the New Testament, you'll know he said, I did not come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. And he most certainly did. From the day he was born, from the times he was born, to the first eight days of his life, he was right about fulfilling the law. And that's glorious. What happens after the manger? God is getting busy. God is setting something up. God is shining. God is showing us something that we enjoy to this very day. I'm just going to take it up in verse 25. At that same time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Now the Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law had required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared to all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. 
See, God is always at work. God is always doing something. And unfortunately, most people don't understand what's going on. Most people, unfortunately, aren't in tune with what God is doing. But God always has a remnant. God always has special called out people. And, and the people who are more in tune to hearing from God during these times are the people who are devout and who, people who seek His face and for people who are prayer warriors. God is looking for such. I think in the 21st century, in the United States of America, He is still seeking such. People who are seeking Him. People who are not looking so hard to their surroundings. People who are looking, where's God in this? God, what are you saying during this? What's my job during this? What am I supposed to do? What am I not supposed to do in all of this? And inquiring to God about that. That is something we need to take note of in times like this. Don't you agree? Amen. You know, I think, you know, like I, I always say this, and I'm always getting accused of being repetitive, but I'm going to keep saying stuff. Until Jesus comes back and takes me out. Seeking the Lord first in all things. Leaning not to our own understanding, as the Bible tells us. Trusting the Lord with all of our heart. You're not born that way, guys. I'm not born that way. I'm still working on it. I mean, our, your first reaction to every circumstance is usually wrong. Usually. Your first... Yeah, you want to be defensive, or you want to give somebody a piece of your mind, or you want to act out this way or that way. That's your, usually your first thing, right? Your first thing is usually sometimes be afraid, or be anxious, or be worried. That's usually your first thing, right? It takes time, prayer, training, sometimes years of making mistakes, getting back up. And then you get to the point where you learn as you grow Learn as you spend time with God to trust Him in all things. And not be so moved by, by your environment. Not be so moved by even your feelings. This is an acquired thing. This is something we learn and we grow in. And as the body of Christ, here in the 21st century, we've got some learning to do. We don't always get it right, do we? We've got to grow in that. We've got to learn to trust in God. And, and, and shut the news off. And maybe step away from the flat screens of any kind just for a while. And seek him on these things. We have an old man here named Simeon who was daily spending time at the altar of God in the temple of God, a holy place that the Lord had set apart for those who are godly to seek him and to bring their offerings. And everybody knew that. And most working class, hardworking people, they came, they did their thing to God, and they honored him the best they could, and then they went about their business. But this particular individual sought God. Every day. All the time. And he, it had been revealed to him in, the, in his spirit that you will not depart this earth until your very eyes have seen the salvation of planet earth. The, the Messiah that all Jews waited for. And, and your eyes will see it. So trusting in God when you're not seeing stuff, there's the rub right there. I mean... When circumstances or things happen, or and when you're when you're believing with all your heart for this, and then this is happening, you know that is life, isn't it? Isn't that no matter what century you live in, that's life. So Simeon had to endure all of that in his old age. Now maybe God promised this to him when he was thirty, or twenty, or seventy, but now here he is in his eighties. Where's it at? What do you do in situations like that? Do you keep trusting, or do you say, ah, must have been a bad pizza I ate that night, and I just got this weird feeling, and come see, come see, or whatever, right? We, we all get tempted to do that. Remember the promise the Lord gave you? Remember when God was speaking to your heart? Were you really feeling his presence in your life? Well, that may have been a while ago. And, and, and in the light of your circumstances, and your age, and your whatever things going on, can you go back and find that and hold to that in spite of? Have faith as the evidence. Not what you see, not what you're hearing, but can you have that faith? Simeon, somehow, in his old age, you know, waiting for a Messiah, and every time he went out of the temple to go 
you know, buy lunch or something, there's Romans out there, right? And you know Romans, they were nice. They were brutal. And they ruled. And then, who's the president? Who's the prime minister? Who's the, the regent of the area? Herod. Oh yeah, that guy. He built us a nice temple, but he's insane. He's paranoid. He's evil. Right? Those, that was the political climate that, that uh, Simeon had to endure every day. And yet, he trusted that God, in due time, would send a Savior. And on top of that, he had this promise in his heart that the Holy Spirit told him, you will not die before your very eyes see the Messiah. And, and we have the privilege, ladies and gentlemen, of reading the day his prayer was answered. The day that God <laughs> manifested the answer to his prayer. And he held a baby in his arms. Isn't that amazing? Here's your answer. Simeon, remember I told you? This is your day. Anybody in here ever had your prayer answered? One. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Two, three, four. Okay, several of them. Right? Do you remember that day your prayer was answered? Maybe it was, oh, please heal this person, or please help me with my job, or help me pay this bill, or whatever. I mean, whatever. Usually, our prayers, when they get to that point of desperation, those are our most intense times of prayer. Am I right? When things are really going south. And I know this well, <laughs> having been through stuff myself. And you guys have been through your thing. It's unfortunate that we have to sometimes get to the very, very, very bottom of things before we look up. <clears throat> right? And, and we learn and we grow. And God is so faithful and so good. He loves us through these times. Well, Israel, at the time that this eight-day-old eight baby is there, wasn't necessarily behaving themselves. Wasn't necessarily all that faithful. I mean, they had a sort of a back pocket, you know, oh, it's, it's the Sabbath, pull out your wallet, show them your, your Jewish ID. Okay, good, it's Monday now, I'll go about my business. You know, in, in modern day Christianity, we have our Christmas and Easter Christians. You know, there's, you know, yeah, we believe in God, yeah, we believe in God, uh-huh, uh-huh. But, yeah, even the devil believes all that. We, we, we know this from Scripture. But who is invested? Who's 100% in this? Usually, my friends, it's someone who's been through the fire. Show me one Old Testament person who did not have to go through a terrible season before they really found their faith in God. I mean, pfft. you want to talk about lion's dance? You want to talk about the Red Sea? You want to talk about the three Hebrew children in the fire? I mean, you, so many instances, examples to us. And uh, just to bring it just a little bit more to the 21st century shortly before I get on to the next person you're going to talk about. Uh, we're in the fire, America. Boy, are we in the fire. Has it ever been so precarious, so divided, so what's going to happen next? Who's going to... I don't want to get into all the politics, stuff, but you know what I'm talking about. These are trying times. These will lead you to your knees, these times. Why didn't God solve this problem three months ago? I don't know. Wish he would have. He didn't. But I know this. He will. He will solve this problem. He will do it mightily. He will do it gloriously. And when he does do it, we will say, well, the judges didn't get it right. The legislators didn't get it right. But God Almighty, he got it right. Amen. And everyone will know. Even his enemies will know. God did this. There'll be some atheists a couple months from now who I believe will say, wow, there really is a God. And God will get all the glory for that. But in the meantime, boys and girls, in the meantime, will we be faithful? Will we seek Him? Will we put our roots down in Him? Will we? I can't answer that for you. You and Jesus got to work that out. I'm just the cheerleader. Rah, rah. Here I am. <laughs> I'm reading you what this is. Old man, all his life was waiting for this day. Had many dark days, had many discouraging times. The wind blew, the snow came, the Romans came, Herod's the king, everything's all screwed up. But now, today, in my 80s, I hold the answer in my arms. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought of it that way? Here he is, and he offers this, this prayer that it wasn't just a prayer, guys. 
It's in our scriptures. The promise that God showed that faithful man in the prayer that he prayed later is written down for all of us Christians to read until Jesus comes back. It's in our Bibles. I'll read that prayer to you one more time before I introduce you to the next character. This is the prayer as he held that precious baby in his arms. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant depart or die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations. And he is the glory of your people Israel. Notice how he said that. The insight this guy had. This isn't just Jewish Messiah. This isn't just our nation's answer to our prayer. This is the answer for the whole world. For people who are lost and dead in their trespasses and sins. All the world is going to benefit from the Savior who came from the Jews. He establishes that first. And then he says, your glory shall be for all Israel. I think that is amazing insight from this old man of God. I mean, uh, any, any Jewish people here today? Well, well, that's okay. We benefit from what happened to the Jewish generation, the, uh, the Jewish tribes, the Jewish people. Our Savior came from their lineage, but we can all enjoy it. It's, it's grafted in branches into that wonderful tree. So here we are. Thank God for his promise. Thank God for the Jewish people. We pray for the peace of Israel. You know, um, have you ever tried to uh, share the gospel with someone who's, who's Jewish, who grew up Jewish? It's tough. Because the, every time I have, I get the eye roll. Without a doubt. <coughs> I said, uh, people, people ask me, you know, oh, you, you, you're a Christian, huh? Why are you a Christian? Well, I believe Jesus came and blah, blah, blah. And, was, you know, and they rolled their eyes. So what? What? Why, why, why are you rolling your eyes? Yeah, we've heard this. We've heard this. We've heard this. Show us. That's, uh, that's usually the, the, the prevailing thing I get. Yeah, all I see is hypocrisy. All I see is people dressed up. All I see is people painting crosses on their shields while they're cutting our throats and stealing and throwing us in the ovens. You know, I hear this from Jewish people. You know, a lot of people have misrepresented Jesus, have had a form of godliness, but their lives did not bear it out. I think what the, what the Jewish people that I've come in contact need to see are genuine Christians, not perfect people, but genuine Christians living it out loud, showing love and compassion, stepping in the way and saying, no, do no harm to these Jewish people. I mean, there were, in, in World War II, people who stood up for them and they paid with their lives, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others, and uh, we don't hear enough about them. But uh, aside from the Jewish thing, let me move on. Uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, because out of their tribes, out of their, their people, came our Messiah. That's why I'm presenting this to you. And Simeon, in his prayer, includes all that. Let's meet the next person while you digest all that. Verse 31. Jesus, I'm sorry, verse 33. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel real to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. Uh, some of the translations, to the rise and fall of many. Uh, that's probably King James. <clears throat> he has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword shall pierce your very soul. I think specifically he said that to Mary. Because we learn later in scripture, as he hung dying on the cross, his mother was right there, we're told. Uh, you know, and uh, we could talk for hours about uh, what Mary had to endure. And probably what she yet endures. <laughs> the reputation she has. She was a humble girl who was 
I don't know, bestowed with the Savior of mankind and had to raise him in her home. I mean, can any of you imagine all the things that would come against her? And, and, and she raised a beautiful boy and she got to see him in his first miracle and you've heard all these things. And, and, and then he was out there and he was proclaiming with mighty power and authority. He was doing miracles. He was raising the dead. And he was speaking these things. And the religious people of the day got super, super irritated and mad and opposed to him, just like Simeon had just said. And then he was sentenced to death. Could she have been prepared for that? Is there any way? How can someone be rewarded like this for, doing, for living such a a precious, perfect life for representing God to us. How could this happen? You know, that, that, that probably shook her and messed with her soul. But we're, we're also led to believe, just another historical note, that uh, on the day of Pentecost, that Mary was there! I don't know if that's uh, as, as provable historically, but I believe it's, it's probably true. Uh, was, was that mentioned in, in the book of Acts as I stand here? Uh, yeah. So, Mary did figure it out. The Holy Spirit did reveal to Mary all the terrible things that she had to endure would change, change and that her tears would be wiped away. And that her boy would be resurrected and he would be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But she still had to go through that time, that season of grief, is my point. You know, as we all do, we all go through our seasons. Let, I, I want to move on to my next character here, if I may. Verse 36. I want you to meet Anna. Now, Anna was a prophet, or a prophetess, as some of your Bibles say. A female prophet. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Wait a minute, Tom. God does not call women to the ministry. Oh, really? He doesn't? Yes. Only men and only men. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a sad planet it would be. I personally feel the greatest ministry on planet Earth is that of mother. And the second only to that would be grandma. Right? You say what you want, but when mama shows up on the scene, you better watch your mouth, right? I, and when grandma shows up, look out! <laughs> you talking about my baby? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you don't want to get mama bear all worked up. I think the, the ministry of a, of a woman never stops. It, it's just an amazing, wonderful thing. And I think the New Testament is clear that, that women can speak on behalf of God. Now, of course, there's, there's uh, orders, there's hierarchies, and there's, there's places about women being under the, the covering of a man. But uh, please, don't tell me that women don't have ministry. I think they have important, very, very important ministry. Now, this lady we're about to meet, let's, let's learn a little bit about her and discuss that. Well, eight days after this Savior is born, she's involved. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel, that's my best shot on that, from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years, so she had been a widow for a considerable amount of time. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God and with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. Let me just say this. This lady was in tune with God. Of course, we've heard just talk about Simeon. He was in tune with God. He had a promise. He was faithful no matter what, no matter who. And in his old age, he got to see and hold the answer to his very prayer. Yes, faithful man. But here's another wonderful thing about God. Confirmation. If God's going to tell you something, he'll show you by his scripture. He'll put a witness in your spirit. And usually, he'll bring someone else into your life who will show you that confirmation. How do I know if God's speaking to me? 
You know, that's a good, very good question. Every Christian should address that question. How do I know when God's saying do this or not do this? You know, I, you know just in, in the case of these people, they were in tune. They heard from God, and they, they fasted, they prayed, they sought Him. These two in particular, a lot, Simeon and, and Anne. Now, most of us, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, paying the bills, working the work, raising the kids, doing the thing, and, and in the midst of that, stuff comes at us, and sometimes we're not in a prayerful state of mind. Sometimes we're just irritated. <laughs> sometimes we're scared. Sometimes we're just exhausted and weary. Isn't that where we live? I mean, I don't live here in the church. I mean, sometimes I feel like I do, but I don't. And, you know, you've got your lives. I mean, you come here once or twice a week, and that's cool. No guilt trip here. But imagine if somebody, every time I unlocked the door, was here at this altar praying every single time. How in tune that person would be. Or every time you call them, I was just praying about you. You know, <laughs> prayer is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It gets you in tune. It gets you into the heart of God. And as you read the scriptures and pray, it really tunes you up. And when God's going to speak, he usually speaks first to a person like that. And then he shares it to the rest of us. And that's a blessing. What a blessing. So this lady who's there praying day and night, who spent, she got married, and, and seven years into the marriage, she lost her husband. She never remarried. She dedicated her days and her nights and her life to seeking the Lord's face. Amazing. That's not very common. It's, it's very beautiful, though. So when the Savior of the world shows up, she's there. And she gets to see it with her own eyes. And she gets to be a confirmation. We have two young parents. They had a dream. She had a vision. And, and they got a baby. And they got a whole lot of money. And they're, they're, they're going one day at a time. And they got shepherds that come and say, we heard the Savior's born here in a major. And, and okay, that's a good confirmation. Now we got this guy named Simeon coming in. He's saying, my eyes have seen the Savior. That's another confirmation. That's giving confidence to Mary and Joseph, don't you think? And now there's a... There's an older lady who's praising God when all this is going on. Another confirmation. What is she going to say? Let's look. <laughs> she came along just as Simon, or sorry, Simeon, was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong and was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. So now, after Simeon had said his piece, comes this lady with a double confirmation on this day. And she starts telling everybody. Simeon was talking primarily to the parents. But Anna, she couldn't just hold it in. She's probably walking all around that temple saying, See? See? There he is! See him? See that little baby? That's our Messiah. He's not only going to save Israel. Like David, he's going to be the answer, the truth, the way, the light. And she's probably going off. And, and, and some people are like, going, Oh, you the crazy lady. <laughs> and some people go, Wow, you mean it's here today? Everybody takes that information differently. Right? But... There's your confirmation, guys. And, and God gave it in you know, bucketfuls of confirmation on this child. Now, again, while this is all going on, the majority of people weren't in tune with it, were they? They still were going about worrying about the Romans, complaining about this. You know, they're going to uprise and take the Romans out with the swords, and they're going to do this and that. And they're complaining about Herod and all. You know, and, and there was maybe a very small percentage saying, wow, is it true? Is the Messiah here? Are we about to be delivered? I mean, and there was that talk. There was that undercurrent. So when Jesus is at the age of 30 and he shows up, right? It wasn't just a, a surprise, was it? There was an undercurrent. He's around. He's coming. And to top it off, God doesn't stop there with the confirmations. There was a crazy man out in the desert. He ate locusts, dressed in camel hair. And he said, repent! Stop sinning. Stop being goofy. Stop ignoring God. Come here, because the day of the Lord is at hand. 
I am the, one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. Prepare the path of the Lord. Right? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy message, but think about yourself and your heart. Think about the times that you're living in. Think about the things that you have to face. And, and, and in the back of your mind, I want you to hear the voice of John the Baptist. He's coming. The Lord is coming. Prepare yourselves. Prepare your head, your heart. Get ready. Here he comes. Now in John's day, he gave them a baptism. They had to publicly step forward and say, I've been screwing up. I've been messing up. I want to get my heart and my head right for the coming of the Lord. You know, that was the baptism of John. I mean, of course, after Jesus died and rose again, we have a different baptism, believer's baptism. But people had to come to terms with, okay, he'd always promised it, and now it's time for me to get in the game. Now it's time to get my head and my heart in the game. So, again, John the Baptist was a confirmation that the Lord is here, and he's going to start working in our lives. Anna, the prophetess, the old lady who waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited for the promise of God. She was there to confirm the arrival of the Savior. And of course, Simeon, in his old age, hearing from God, waiting in spite of this, that, and the other, in spite of who's in charge or who's not in charge, or, or the corruption in the temple, the priests, they were on the take. They were evil. I mean, they brought, they brought animals. The poor people would bring their animals to the temple. And they'd say, well, you can't really bring that in here. Uh, you got the wrong money. What do you mean the wrong money? Well, this, we need temple money. Well, all I got is these denarii or these whatever I got here. Well, we can exchange those for you and let you do your deal. But we need a little on top, right? Money changers in the temple. Jesus later dealt with all that, didn't he? You didn't take too kindly. You know, I, the more I think about it, if you, you've thought about this too. The only people that Jesus really got mad at were the people who misrepresented his father. In the temple, the priests who, who got off on being popular and rich and who made people's life miserable, they did not teach the word of God. They were figureheads who only wanted to feather their own nest. Jesus called them a brood of vipers, didn't he? I mean, did he get mad at the adulterous woman? <laughs> or the, you know, the Roman, when the Roman came to, to ask for prayer for a servant, did he get mad at him? You brutal Roman, what you're doing to my people, you should be ashamed of yourself. Did he say that? Who does Jesus get mad at? People who misrepresent his honor. The rest of us, we enjoy his mercy. We enjoy his grace, don't we? In spite of what we've done and said in our past, the, the wrong cigarettes that we smoked, you know, those fancy jazz cigarettes, <laughs> and, the, and the things that we did in our youth. The, I didn't do that. You know, we lied through our teeth and all of that. He still looks at us and he says, Oh, I still love you. You rascals. <laughs> I know you've screwed up. I know you've done this, that, and the other. And I know your intentions of your heart are evil continuously. And no, there's none righteous, not even one. I still love you guys. I love you a lot. So when we see Jesus working out his ministry in the later years, we see him coming up to these people who are broken. The poor lady who had been to so many doctors and so many doctors and so many doctors and never got healed. And she said, oh, if I could just touch the hem of his garments. If I could just reach out. Who touched me? What are you talking about, Jesus? People here who touched you. No. I know someone had a heart of desperation. I know someone from a very low place in their life has reached out to me. I know it. And he knew it when that lady struggled to that crowd and touched him. He showed her that day the heart of God. He showed her, hey, sinner, hey, loser, hey, outcast, hey, you, you who have been put aside. Hey, you who can't get a doctor's report or you can't get a job. Or you, I love you. And I have sent you my biggest and my best. And you may enjoy it now. Come on, sinner. Come here. You knucklehead. <laughs> I love you. The love of God for sinners like Tom Millis. Oh, yeah. 
You are a sinner. Don't stay that way. Don't revel in it. Don't be proud of your sins. Don't just stand up here and talk about all the dumb, stupid things you've done. Talk about the grace of God. Talk about the goodness of God. Come as you are. I always say this. I'm repetitive. <laughs> Come as you are, but do not stay as you are. This thing in Christianity that we enjoy called <coughs> sanctification. Reading the Word of God, letting it wash over us. Hearing the Word of God being spoken by the bald-headed guy from Shooting and others. <laughs> Hearing it and letting it get in you and, and, and let the, the Spirit of God do surgery, do heart surgery in you. And, and, and let the Word of God and the Spirit of God do some things in this brain of yours, this problem-solving menace between our ears. Let it, let it affect us. Let us see the works of Christ. Let us hear the, the miracles and the things He did and His attitudes. And he, let us hear Him explain who His Father is and, and how He loves us and what He wants to do for us. It will change you. It will transform you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Because old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That is our, our, our testimony. That is our witness, Christians. Right? It started with a little helpless baby in the manger. Who even when he was eight days old was fulfilling scriptures. Multiple confirmations. Uh, let me ask you this about you. Do you have a confirmation in your life when you reached out to God and He met you there? Where He took you by the hand and said, I got you? Do you have that? It's there. It is available. It happens all the time. And sometimes, guys, we got to get so far out on the limb in life that there ain't no way back. The only way out now is God. I think America is about there. We are so far out on this limb of corruption and all the, all the terrible things that are going on in our society. And, and I think the first thing God wants to do is wake up the church. Wake up the church. Get them praying. And then God, through us, guys, through us, the light of the world, we're to speak to our neighbors we're to speak up to our legislators and our government people and say, hey, God is with us. God is in us. We're not going to tolerate this anymore. We are rising up in the name of the Lord in these crazy days, in these last days. And we're going to stand for Christ no matter what. We've been asleep long enough. We come because we have a testimony. We once were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, but now we see. We believe with all our hearts that Jesus birthed this nation. And we live a pretty decent life. And we want the same thing for our kids and our grandkids. We don't want to sell out our country anymore. So here we are, guys, in our times. 21st century. What's the magic date we're looking for now? January 6th. And beyond that, January 20th. We got some praying to do. We got some faith to hold on to and to maintain in dark times. And as I read the scriptures, God always comes through. The dark times, he's never too late. We always want it two months earlier, don't we? We go, I liked it back then. November would be nice. <laughs> We're 10 years ago. But he's working this out. And maybe he's turning up the heat on us for a while to get us really praying. I don't know. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? Isn't it? So, that is my blah, blah, blah to you this morning. You and the Holy Spirit, you work this out. Let this get into your heart and in your head. You think about it. And you pray with it, about it. And let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord tune you up in these last days. For the reason of being a light in your community. For the reason of healing your broken heart. And easing your troubled mind. This is God's will for you this day. I believe that with all my heart. And uh, thank God for this season of Christmas where a little baby came and changed the world one day at a time. So I would like to pray.